Question I have specifically around the rapamycin. Um, if you feel comfortable speaking about dosing and how to pulse and also side effects. With you, there are there are side effects in the context of how it was developed as an organ transplant drug. And I think that's mostly where the side effect data comes from. I would say even there, I'm just going to say it. People can get upset with me if they want to. Side effects of rapamycin aren't as bad as the side effects of exercise. Nowhere near as penetrant as the side effects of exercise. So I think putting it in perspective is, is important, but yeah, side effects are a risk. So I can't tell you about, um, I can't give you any certainty. So I'm gonna, hopefully that means I'm credible. Um, what I can tell you is sort of my anecdotal observations and the little bit of data that I've got. So most of the people who are using rapamycin for potential health span benefits are doing weekly dosing somewhere between three and eight milligrams once a week. Um, there's no rhyme or reason, as far as I can tell, for what people are choosing or why they're choosing it. That weekly dosing came from mostly a couple of studies that Joan Manick uh, led, where they did weekly dosing with Everolimus, which is a derivative of rapamycin, and they saw fewer side effects at higher doses when you did weekly dosing compared to daily dosing. The organ transplant patients, as far as I know, are always doing a daily dosing regimen. So that's one difference between what most of the biohackers are doing and how it's been used in organ transplant patients. Um, so again, that's usually the dosing range. Some people are going like 20 migs a week. I haven't heard, so, so I haven't heard any horror stories and we've got, we've collected data from over 300 rapamycin users. And there are obviously lots more out there. That doesn't mean there haven't been any horror stories, but I haven't heard any. Um, so the side effects that seem real to me for sure are some people get mouth sores, some people get high triglycerides. Um, it probably increases bacterial risk infection a little bit, but I don't know of any quantitative data to su support that. Um, I don't know of any, doesn't mean it hasn't happened. I don't know of anybody who's shown any glucoregulatory side effects on that weekly dosing of rapamycin. Um, and that's about it. So, so I don't really know of anybody who's gotten really sick or had any any real problems. Again, it doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but I haven't. It hasn't come across my my radar. Um, and most people don't experience any side effects that they notice, as far as I as far as I can tell, on that sort of you know once weekly three to to six milligram um, dosing regimen. So that does that answer your question? Yeah, it's super helpful. And what's the longest term duration of a person that you know who's taken this? So there, I know of people who've taken it for many years. So, you know, three plus years. Um, and, and actually that's the other thing that you asked about the, the sort of cycling regimen. Most people don't cycle. Most people take it continuously. Um, the, the reason why I started cycling really well, so there's two reasons. One is we'd published in mice that 10 weeks of treatment with rapamycin was, or 12 weeks of treatment was enough to knock down a bunch of sterile inflammatory markers, increase lifespan and improve at least the measures of health span that we looked at. So we knew in, I knew in mice that for multiple tissues and organs, you know, six to 12 weeks was enough to get an effect. Um, and then, and, and in my specific case, the first time I started taking it was because I got diagnosed with, uh, adhesive capsulitis, which is inflammation of the shoulder capsule, frozen shoulder. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, there wasn't the, the specialist didn't want to do anything for me, except send me to physical therapy, which was making it worse. And so I did research and I found, you know, I figured out it was an age related inflammatory disease. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll give rapamycin a try. I can't, can't hurt. I guess it could hurt, but it, you know, probably wouldn't hurt. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, and I went in planning to do a 12 week or, or 10 week cycle within a couple of weeks, I noticed an improvement in the pain in my shoulder. And within 10 weeks, it was 90% fixed and it hasn't come back. And so that's what, that's why I started doing that, you know, 10 to 12 week cycling regimen myself, but the vast majority of people who are taking it, um, off label are doing continuous rapamycin. And sorry, one last question. Are people just using the regular, um, rapamune or? Oh yeah. Rapamune or the sort of serolimus, uh, tablets, the generic tablets that you can get. The one thing I would say is, um, uh, compounded rapamycin probably has problems. So there's a few people now I know who have measured bioavailability of uh, powdered compounded rapamycin in capsules. So rapamycin is known to be unstable at, at enteric pH. 
And that's probably why people get low bioavailability from the, the compounded stuff. Whereas the tablets, both rapamine and the, the serolimus tablets are formulated in a way to get, get into the small intestine. So yeah, most people though are using either the rapamine or the, the, the tablet, serolimus tablets. Um, you had mentioned um, that there's been some success stories in humans with rapamycin. Um, can you share in general terms what that looked like? Yeah. So, well, so I just told you about one, my shoulder, which, which I believe, I mean, again, could be placebo effect, but I believe it, it fixed it. Um, so I don't know how many of you have heard of Alan Green. He's kind of the most famous rapamycin doctor, or at least he, he started it. So um, he has told the story about how he was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And he started taking rapamycin for that reason. And it seemed to regress at least somewhat. Um, and then there are several people who I have talked to as we've been starting to collect data with different autoimmune disorders. So it seems to me that rapamycin is most effective for a variety of different autoimmune conditions. Um, and that makes biological sense. So I, it would not surprise me if, if many autoimmune mediated disorders are responsive to once weekly rapamycin or maybe maybe daily, but, um, but the kinds of rapamycin doses that, that, that people are thinking about in this, this context. And so there are several that I know of in that case. There are also several people who have claimed that their um, oral health has improved pretty dramatically to the point where their dentist has commented on it. So, you know, I, that, that could be real. Um, again, it's, it's hard to know for sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited because uh, my former grad student, John Ahn, who's a dental dentist PhD, is actually starting a clinical trial for periodontal disease. So hopefully we'll get some really good trial data from that to see. But those are the kinds of conditions where, you know, I've heard more than just one report of people saying that, that they felt like they were getting improvements from rapamycin. You have to get it medically prescribed. Is that right? Legally, yes. <laughs> and I recommend people do that if they're going to take it. But there are there are people who get it from all sorts of all sorts of sources, and they tell me about it, and I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, would you like to know how to use food as medicine for your genes? Get access to my free webinar using the link in the video description. I hope you enjoyed the webinar, and if you do, please make sure to comment and share.